This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers and the reading on working capital and liquidity. A couple of things I want to mention before we get into the slide deck, the first of which is almost completely irrelevant to your studying. I noticed that there was no author credited for writing this particular reading. The other two are a little bit more important. The first thing that I noticed about this reading is that even though it's called working capital, which we know is in a, essentially a comparison between the top right and the top left hand side of the balance sheet. Of course, that goes along with the word liquidity. The, the reading, and I want to say the author or authors, but we don't know who they are, do not ignore uh, the long term elements of uh, working capital decisions. So that's really important. And in a few readings, we're going to have an entire conversation on capital structure. And so what I'll try to do in that future uh, recording is link that capital structure decision back with uh, the working capital decision, which of course is the focus here. Uh, the second part that I think is really important is that although there are only 10 practice problems at the end of this reading, I, I think they're really good. And I wish I knew who the author was so I could credit him or her. Because uh, in my opinion, these 10 questions uh, are the result of the CFA Institute trying to uh, make level one, two, and three exams as similar as possible, even though you know, you have multiple choice and, and short answers and essay, but some of these questions at the end of the of reading are, are really, really good. In other words, what you'll see is kind of like a question stem. And when you get to level three, you'll have an entire page of a question stem, and then you'll have six questions relating to that question stem. And what I think are some of the best questions out there are inside of that question stem where uh, an analyst makes a comment like, you know, working capital is really important for a company. And then the question will be, do you agree or disagree with that statement? And I really love those kinds of questions. And they really get you thinking about, uh, you know, potentially an actual real live example. So make certain that after you watch this, you go uh, answer those 10 questions. So here are the LOSs. And Notice that there's the word liquidity in a bunch of these here. So we're going to focus on liquidity and recall from our financial statement discussion that liquidity really in its base form means how quickly can you turn an asset into cash? Not so much so that you can have a lot of cash on hand, but so that you can meet short term obligations. And then probably that last LOS is a summation of the first uh, four of those. And these are probably where the better exam questions will come. Evaluate the funding choices that, uh, that firms have so that they can manage their working capital position. And you'll see what I mean as we go through this here. All right, so here we go, ready? Working capital, we know this from uh, uh, probably our undergraduate days but clearly in some previous uh, level one readings, current assets minus current liabilities. And so, boy, what do we want? Do we want current assets to be higher or lower than current liabilities? Boy, that's a silly question to start off, uh, start off this recording. So what do we want? We want to have some positive working capital position where our current assets are greater than our current liabilities. You take the difference between those two and uh, and we call that uh, we call that net working capital. So what goes on the top left hand side of the balance sheet? You know this cash and equivalents, uh, receivables, inventories, and then other types of financial assets that have you know maturities. I guess the accountants tell us that it's probably less than one year. But you know if you had a uh, if you had some type of a short term security that matures in 372 days for some odd reason, you, you'd probably put it in there as well. Liabilities, these are all the payables. Uh, these are financial liabilities, accrued expenses, and then, uh, and then deferred income. So let's go ahead and look at that last teardrop point, working capital management. So what does this mean? We need to look at our current assets. We need to look at our current liabilities and then we need to manage them, right? Because we have all these people on the right hand side of the balance sheet who uh, 
to whom we owe money, and they're going to knock on our door and say, uh, hey, Jim, when are you going to pay us? So we need to figure out how we're going to do that. So look at the two arrow points at the bottom. So we need we need enough of these short term assets and it has to be accessible. You know, so there's the there's the the link to the word liquidity to manage day to day operations. And then we want to avoid excess reserves. Um, you know, we don't want to have just, just go up to the green box up there. You know, suppose we're a company and uh, and we have I'm going to throw out an extreme example here. Suppose we have a trillion dollars in cash. <laughs> You know, what's the return on cash? Essentially, essentially zero. Although in 2022, you know, with inflation and interest rates rising, uh, maybe that uh, return on cash becomes, you know, one or two or three percent. But still, it's not the 10 or 12 or 15 percent return that we want on our capital budgeting projects. All right. How about the LOS that asks us to compare methods to finance working capital? Oh, boy. So we have essentially two choices. We have the short term and, and we have the long term and each source of capital has different risks. So I want you to think about that, that red arrow, short term sources. These increase the risk of insolvency or are, are we managing insolvency? Insolvency is the definition is that uh, the inability for the firm to meet its short term obligations. Bankruptcy or financial distress, however, comes with a bank loan or a bond issue. Now, of course, we can go to the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet for uh, equity, you know, either preferred or common shares. And then we can throw some uh, hybrid securities in there. Uh, the reading mentions a convertible bond in which a bondholder has the right but not the obligation to convert those bonds into outstanding shares. Now, we'll talk at length about that when we do our capital structure recording, when we worry about uh, the capital structure decision and what type of a bond to issue if, in fact, a bond issue is called for. All right, so how can we finance our working capital? And let me just go back here kind of quickly here. So how are we doing this? Over on the left-hand side, there are all of our current assets. So how can we finance those current assets over on the right-hand side? Well, we can do this internally with operating cash flow. What have we said and what have you heard me say multiple times? Goal of the business is to maximize the value of the firm to its owners. How do we do this? We find capital budgeting projects that have sustainable operating cash flows, right? We want to make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. What the reading does is it emphasizes the after tax notion of the operating cash flows. What I'm going to emphasize is the sustainability portion of those operating cash flows, which brings me back to my conversation that uh, another way to achieve the goal of the business is to find product lines that are going to be branded product lines. And of course, uh, those operating cash flows, we need to uh, take out some interest and dividend payments because what we're doing is we're saying something like, all right, we generate all these cash flows, making something for pennies and sell it for dollars. And we have to be cognizant of the simple fact of the manner in which we got those original cash proceeds to invest in these capital budgeting projects. So we got them from bondholders, we owe them interest, and we got them from shareholders, we owe them uh, dividend payments. So that's why we bolded that minus word over on the right hand side there. Now look at the blue, uh, the blue arrow point there. And I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, Jim, aren't we being kept in obvious here? So more predictable and sustainable after tax operating cash flows enables a company to fund itself internally. Uh, I, I use my sons, uh, two of my sons, as an example here. They have their debit cards funded internally by my wife and I, who regularly go uh, to their accounts and just put money in there and they see things like, oh, well, we have to put gas in our car. Oh, we need to eat after a soccer game. Oh, we need to go to Target and buy Pokemon cards. So what are we doing? My wife and I are internally funding. And so that comes, of course, from our income and the firms do the same thing. You know, what would we rather do? We'd rather have tons and tons of operating cash flow so we can finance both working capital and then capital budgeting projects. You know, that's an, that's another reading. 
But of course, uh, even large firms and even successful branded product line firms, you know, have these issues where they have to manage working capital. And so how, how else do we do this? So there's the second uh, part in green there. We're going to uh, manage the receivables and the payables. And so, you know, what would we like to do in a, in a perfect world? We would like to tell all of the people uh, that owe money to us, we would like to say to them, hey, you owe us $100. How about if you pay us today? You know, we want to collect those receivables as quickly as possible. But on the other hand, to all of those people, now when I say people, of course, I mean organizations, all those organizations to whom we owe money, we're going to say something like, oh boy, it'd be great if I had the money to pay you today, but I don't. Can I pay you next week? Can I pay you next month? Can I pay you next year? You know, so what we want to do is we want to, you know, quickly receive cash and we want to, uh, within the law and within the terms of the contract, you know, pay, uh, uh, make our payables at the last possible moment. And then, of course, what do we have as a business uh, on the left hand side of the balance sheet? You know, we might have physical inventory if, uh, you know, if we're here, how about I take my glasses off? You know, if we're a lens manufacturing company, we have we have an inventory of, I wouldn't even know what that inventory is, but there's probably raw materials, work in progress, and then finished goods. So what do we want to do? We want to sell them. Um, I regularly get texts, I'm guessing you guys do this, who are uh, uh, challenged with your vision from my eye doctor saying, you know what, it's been uh, a long time since we've seen you. You better come in and have an eye exam so that we can test your eyes so that we can, you know, go ahead and get you new glasses. And, you know, Jim, boy, these glasses, look how old they are. They're smeared and they're scratched. And you don't look very handsome in them. We have a great line that'll turn you into, uh, turn you into Sean Connery. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to make certain that we manage the marginal costs and the marginal benefits because the eye, the, the lens manufacturer and company, they don't want to have a billion lenses and a billion frames in their warehouse because, you know, A, there are tremendous opportunity costs, not to mention uh, a whole slew of other costs in there. And so when I was, when I was in college, uh, this is when we came up with that. When I say we, I don't mean me. We came up with this just-in-time inventory evaluation model where, you know, here I am, I come to the eye doctor and the eye doctor saying, you know what, Jim, your glasses, you need new ones. And so as soon as I make the decision in my brain to, uh, to purchase a new lens and new frames, somehow that goes from my brain to the factory and they start making it. And so as soon as I say, yes, I need these glasses, oh, they magically appear. So think about all the costs and the benefits associated with that decision. And by the way, the inventory model, uh, inventory models are really fascinating um, mathematical and calculus related uh, ways of taking this, what I just described in my brain of applying marginal costs and marginal benefits. And then marketable securities, of course, we had this uh, lengthy conversation back in our financial statement days where we can uh, also invest, just like you and I do as corporations, we can invest in stocks and bonds. All right, so those are the internal ones. How about if we go outside? Uh, lines of credit this is exactly like uh, probably you have with your local financial institution where you can just pick up the phone and you can say something like, you know what, I, I need $10,000. And they'll just, they won't even ask you any questions. They'll say, you know what, you're a great customer. Here's your $10,000 and here's the interest rate. When do you think you'll pay us back? You know, so businesses have the same, uh, the same kind of an arrangement with financial institutions. So just remember the difference between the uncommitted, the committed and revolving credit. And we can move down that right-hand side of the balance sheet uh, to a secured loan. So remember, those those uh, those lines of credit they probably have no uh, no collateral, but the secured loans will require a collateral. You know, so what could you and I do? We could go down to the bank and say, hey, you know what? I've got I've got a hundred thousand dollars in equity in my home. Uh, you know, I want to borrow ten thousand dollars against uh, against that uh, collateral. You know, so the bank will write you know maybe a secondary mortgage or you know, I mean, they can call it whatever they want. But then, of course, you give up that equity in your home. You know, it could be a car, it could be your business. I mean, uh, it could be, could be almost anything. 
And then there are web-based lenders who offer, uh, who offer small amounts. Um, I want to say something about collateral. This is really important. So if you have the equity in your home, then you, know, you have to find somebody out there who's going to convince the financial institution that you really have $100,000 in equity in your home. So you have to bring in an appraiser. And you might remember, I, I use this example all the time in class, and I, I've probably done it in a handful of these, uh, of these recordings, although you'll probably hear it more in, uh, in our level two and level three videos. Um, but I always think of what's the perfect, the perfect collateral. And I go back to uh, my favorite series of movies, one of my favorite series of comedy movies, the, the Pink Panther Diamond. You know, if you had the Pink Panther Diamond and you use that as collateral, I mean, the bank would essentially lend you as much uh, as you p could possibly want. And then that Pink Panther Diamond would serve as, you know, almost perfect collateral. So think of Pink Panther, think of Peter Sellers and Steve Martin, for those of you who are younger, what fun movies those are, uh, as kind of like the perfect collateral. And then as you move away from it, like, like my example with the $100,000 in home equity loan, well, you're really kind of relying on somebody else's assessment of the value of, of the home. And then, of course, we can go uh, outside of our local financial institutions. We can go to the commercial paper market. We can uh, we can go to the bond market, and then we can go to uh, we can go to the equity markets in there. Uh, don't uh, eliminate the. Remember, we had a conversation on bankers' acceptances, even though the reading doesn't emphasize that here. So that's uh, that's another external financing example. All right, so let's move on to the next LOS, relationship between working capital, liquidity, and short-term funding needs. All right, so I feel like I've decided, I feel like I've given you a pretty good idea of what that relationship looks like. Um, once again, we're really just talking about marginal costs and marginal benefits. I mean, look in the middle of the slide there, we've got costs and benefits. All right, so working capital requirements is probably a function of the business model. So the reading just compares retail businesses, which probably have a greater need for working capital management and some more efficient working capital models than does a tech company, which probably has substantially lower working capital needs. So look at the look at the second bullet point there. Identify optimal levels of inventory, receivables, and payables. So look at this. We, you know, this is marginal costs and marginal benefit. I was telling you about these cool inventory models, but there are also some receivable models and payable models. I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to manage your cash inflows and cash outflows in the short term on, on a daily basis. Notice the last arrow point there. We've got uh, we've got the word optimal again, optimal combination of short and long term debt. I mean, clearly, if you borrow in the short term, you're probably going to pay a lower interest rate than if you borrow in the long term. Now, of course, you got to worry about financial flexibility, and this is why some firms, I've mentioned this in previous recordings, two of the most famous, you know. Uh, Coca-Cola and Walt Disney have issued 100-year bonds. Now, I'm clearly not going to make the following statement. In fact, if you get this in your question stem, you probably want to disagree with it uh, on the exam. You know, let's suppose I, I, I'm, a, I'm a company, I'm Jim's Concrete Company, and you read in the question stem, uh, Jim has issued a 100-year bond in the amount of a billion dollars to fund its daily working capital needs of a million dollars a day or something. You know, so you don't want to borrow in the long term, in the super long term. Is that a word? I'm not sure that's a finance term, but think about the Coca-Cola bond as a super, uh, super long-term bond. Uh, I, I'm not sure that meets the nature of what the reading asks us to understand about financial flexibility. So don't forget the matching between the right hand and the left hand side of the balance sheet. We want to match not, not maturities, we want to match durations, which in the short term here, you know, duration and maturity are probably uh, identical or nearly identical numbers. All right, how about some working capital strategies? What we can do is we can be conservative, we can be aggressive, or we can be moderate. So what does this conservative approach tell us? Exactly what you might suggest is that, okay, 
we don't ever want to run out of cash to meet our short-term obligations. So when we generate these operating cash flows, what we're going to do is we're going to invest them in the short term. So we're going to have lots more cash, we're going to have lots more receivables, and we're going to have lots more inventory. What we can do then at the other end of the spectrum is we can have an aggressive approach in which we're going to have less of a commitment to those current assets, um, but we're probably going to have to uh, rely on some flexibility so that you know maybe we'll have to go to the capital markets. Here, here's the example that I want to give you. Um, over the years in my introductory finance course, I, I take students to uh, Yahoo Finance and we go to you know a particular company and a lot of times I'll just pick Procter & Gamble. And so when we're in this conversation about Procter & Gamble and liquidity, we go ahead and compute, uh, we, we compute a ratio. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But I look at the difference between current assets and current liabilities for Procter & Gamble and they're not normally what you would think. In fact, uh, current assets for Procter & Gamble typically have been less than current liabilities. And so I ask my students, I say, look, is Procter & Gamble in danger of becoming insolvent? And the answer is, of course not. Procter & Gamble, you know, they make a thousand products that we use every day. And so uh, Procter & Gamble would fit into this aggressive approach. Now, of course, Procter & Gamble, here, let me go back here. Procter & Gamble, how far back do I got to go here? You know, Procter & Gamble, you know, this gigantic company, it uses the commercial paper market all the time to uh, manage its working capital. And then, of course, there's a moderate pro approach somewhere in between aggressive and conservative. And so I'm going to give you kind of a sense here in just a few minutes about, about what that means. All right, continuing our conversation about this relationship, let's go ahead and focus on uh, arguably the most important financial ratio that we discussed back in our financial statement days. Uh, return on equity. So remember, what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. So it makes perfect sense then to go ahead and come up with some kind of a metric that measures uh, how well we're delivering the maximizing shareholder wealth goal. And the simplest way to do this is just take net income over shareholders equity. So what kind of a return on equity do we want? Well, we want to have lots and lots of net income and we want to compare that to a relatively small amount of sh uh, average shareholders equity and average there by the way let me just remind you you know so we'll take last year's shareholders equity and this year's shareholders equity and just take uh, take the average between those two now what we can do is uh we can whoops i didn't mean to do that we can go ahead and decompose return on equity into some of its component parts. So all we're going to do is I want you to skip down to the uh, to the double arrow point there. What we're going to do is we're going to take net income over in the top left numerator, and then I want you to go over to the way bottom right denominator average shareholders equity. Everybody see that? So return on equity is still net income over average shareholders equity. But then what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to perform some neat little uh, math trick where we're going to put an account in the numerator and an account in the denominator so they cancel. And those two accounts are going to be revenues and total assets. So I want you to think about what, what that means. If we take total assets and we put that in the denominator and we put revenue in the numerator, what does that give us? Well, that gives us some sense of our ability to invest in long-term assets and generate P times Q, right? P times Q is equal to revenue. So, uh, Back in our old days, we called that total asset turnover. There we have it in the box. But that total asset turnover is really a, a way to measure a manager's efficiency in being able to make these long-term investments and convert those into the first layer of cash, right? What are operating cash flows? When you compute operating cash flows, you have to start with cash revenues. All right. So that's really all we're doing here. And I'm guessing you guys remember this is called the first stage of the DuPont analysis named after that uh, that famous company. And so all we're doing then is we're taking that total asset turnover in the middle ratio and then we're just throwing 
the revenue in the denominator over on the left-hand side, and we're throwing average total assets in the numerator over on the right-hand side. And oh my gosh, lo and behold, we get some other interesting ratios. And that's the way we're breaking up this return on equity. So look what we have. We have net profit margin, right? Net income over revenues. We have total asset turnover, which we just described. And then if we take assets over equity, we get some measure of leverage. And so this is how we decompose return on equity, net profit margin times total asset turnover times leverage. And that is a thing of beauty there. This was the great contribution of the DuPont company, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, because it takes that simple return on equity that we talked about right at the top of the slide, and it makes it more complex. And it makes it more complex so that we have a better understanding of how managers maximize shareholder wealth. What do they do? Are you ready for this? So in that net profit margin, that is a summation of what I described earlier. Make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. The middle total asset turnover is how clever the executive leadership team, the financial managers are in identifying product lines, right? I've told you this many times before. Don't think of total assets over there as, you know, just these dull and boring assets. Think of them as the product lines. Remember, I gave you the example of the Harley Davidson motorcycle or the Apple iPhone, which I do not have, right? Total asset turnover. Those product lines, which are a function of the investment in total assets, how do they pay off over on the income statement? And then finally, well, what is the managers, what is the executive leadership team, what is the board of directors attitude towards leverage? Do they want lots of debt in capital structure or do they want minimal debt in capital structure? Oh, wait till we get to, wait till you watch our capital structure recording here in just a few readings. All right, so here we go, evaluating the impact uh, of working capital approach. And so what we're doing here is we're taking these three, these three, let me just go back here quickly. We're taking these three ratios and we're gonna summarize them into, all right, boy, look at this number one, the just-in-time inventory management. Think of my lens example that, uh, that I just described requesting quicker payments and accelerating cash collections. All right, so reducing working capital, this is how we use uh, those three ratios, profit margin, uh, asset turnover, and leverage to become more effective working capital managers. Now, every once in a while, I will tell you guys to get out your phones and take a picture of a slide. I'm going to do that right now. So go ahead, take a picture of this and you'll have, oh my gosh, I don't know. What have I, have I said this to you maybe 30 times during our level one recording? So you have all these on your phone, you know, put them in a folder. And when you're sitting on the train or an airplane or you have nothing to do and you're, you're playing Wordle or something, throw that right out and get, get, my, uh, get my pictures out. Uh, from our slides and just continue to go over these. So here's really just a, sum, a summary of the financial impact of conservative, moderate, and aggressive and how they relate to, well, what we just talked about here, current asset levels, financing required, financing costs, flexibility, risk, and equity returns. And so those should make perfect sense uh, in relation to what I've talked about over the last, you know, what has that been, 20 minutes or 30 minutes so far of this recording. All right, sources of primary and secondary liquidity. All right, I've already given you that definition. The firm's ability to meet its short-term obligations. All right, so lack of liquidity leads to insolvency. All right, so this is a great exam question from my perspective that when we have these working capital problems, these are going to be insolvency issues. Now they might lead to financial stress and they might lead to bankruptcy, but remember bankruptcy only results when you get a judge to come in and slam down his or her gavel and say, you know what, you've failed to meet the terms of your contract with the bondholders. 
I'm going to put you into. And remember, we've got all these different chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 11 and chapter 13. And there's probably a chapter 62 and a chapter 85 of these different types of bankruptcies. I made that up, the uh, 62 and 85, by the way. All right, so what are primary sources of liquidity? We, we know that from our conversations, ready cash balances, short-term funds, cash flow management. But then here, let's go ahead and add free cash flow. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, two definitions here. And this is really going to help you, not just with this, uh, with this reading, but with lots and lots of other readings. Are you ready for this? So my definition of operating cash flow is the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid operating cash flow after all expenses have been paid free cash flow you ready for this it's the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid right i just gave you that definition let me repeat that free cash flow is the amount of cash remaining after all expenses have been paid and all investments have been made and the all investments have been made component of that definition includes short and long-term investments. Now, that's really important for us here in working capital management, but it's also important for our discussion in capital structure. Are you ready for this really silly example? But I guarantee you that you're going to remember this on the exam as it relates to a, a free cash flow question. All right, let's suppose I'm Jim. I have Jim's Donut Factory and I make lots and lots of really good donuts, you know, with the chocolate and the cherries and the strawberries. I make all those really, really great donuts. So one day, one day I wake up and I say, you know what? I think people want some healthy donuts. I'm going to make a cauliflower chocolate donut. Well, what do I need? What do I need to make a cauliflower chocolate donut that I don't have? You see where I'm going with this? Well, I'm going to have to have an inventory of cauliflower. So I'm going to have to either go out and grow cauliflower on my back farm, or I'm going to have to buy cauliflower. And so I want you to think of this big pallet sitting in my factory that has a pile of cauliflower on it. That's an investment in inventory. Where do I get this? Well, I mean, I could get it a lot of different places. But when I make that investment in the cauliflower, it's necessarily going to reduce my free cash flow. Oh, man. Cauliflower, chocolate donut. I bet somebody has made that at some point in their lives. All right, how about secondary sources of liquidity? Negotiating debt contracts. Boy, I love this. Uh, this is probably going to occur before a judge gets involved. And so what, what are we going to do? If I'm Jim's, uh, Jim's donut maker, what, what can I do? I can pick up the phone and I can call um, uh, all the people to whom I owe, owe money, all those organizations, which might include a financial institution, which might include an insurance company, and it might include my neighbor who's a, who's a cauliflower farmer. Right. And I could just say, oh, you know what? I really don't have a bunch of money today to pay you. Can I pay you? Can I pay you next month or can I pay you next year? Or can we restructure? So negotiating debt contracts. Yeah, I always struggle when I read something like this source of liquidity. We can always sell our assets. Of course, of course, we can also sell our assets. But notice the last part of that sentence without substantial loss in value. Well, you know what? If I'm Milton Hershey and I need some liquidity and I say something like, you know what? I'm gonna sell my Hershey Kiss uh, product line. I mean, if I go out there and signal to the market that I need to sell this asset, I'm not gonna get nearly the market value that I should. So make sure, make sure that you consider this, especially on the exam that without substantial loss in value, that's a, that's a super important part of that sentence. Now, of course, I don't really know what without substantial loss in value. I mean, I would have no idea what the Milton Hershey Kiss product line is worth. Let, let's just say, let me pick a number. Uh, let me pick a number. How much, how much should I pick? A hundred billion dollars? You know, would Milton Hershey want to sell it for 97 billion? I, I don't know. That, that doesn't sound substantial to me, but 80 billion, that sounds super substantial. And then I've mentioned bankruptcy protection and reorganization. So look at the last arrow points here. It's expensive. Of course, it's expensive because when you do all this stuff, 
um, you're probably going to have to hire a lawyer. And then that gets uh, super complicated. Uh, but then look at the first one there, failing financial health of a company. Of course, these things are in the secondary source of liquidity, they're probably not, uh, there's probably not good news. You're not high-fiving each other uh, in Jim's uh, chocolate factory when we're selling some of our uh, conveyor belts. Uh, all right, how about this? Factors that impact a company's liquidity position. All right, we've talked about this, right? The timing of receipts. You know, the ideal scenario would be that whenever we owe someone money, that somebody who owes us money pays us, you know, so we take from over here and we pay, we pay over there. But that's probably not going to happen uh, unless we're super clever and super uh, able to manage our, our working capital. So notice that term that the reading uses, a drag on liquidity. So uncollected receivables obsolete inventory, tight credit. That makes sense. All right. Timing of disbursements. That makes pool uh, perfect sense. So remember, here, let me go back here. Drag on liquidity and pool on liquidity. Look for those terms. Uh, look for those terms in the question stem. <clears throat> All right. Liquidity ratio. I want to swing back to what I was saying about, what was that one slide about? Moderate and uh, conservative and aggressive. <clears throat> and I want to go back to my I want to go back to my Procter and Gamble example. <clears throat> if you even right now go to the Yahoo Finance webpage and look at Procter and Gamble's current assets and current liabilities, you'll find that current assets are less than current liabilities. And uh, this has been true of Procter and Gamble for years. And so what the accountants would say is that a current ratio of less than one, which of course is Procter & Gamble, is the technical or the accounting definition of insolvency. But there's no way you can make the claim that Procter & Gamble is insolvent. So what do they do? They, they clearly don't have that, uh, that conservative approach. But remember, lots and lots of firms are out there, especially on the CFA level one exam, who are not going to be Procter and Gamble. And so remember that we probably want this current ratio to be uh, high enough to be able to. Well, what does it say over on the interpretation side? Satisfy current liabilities using current assets. I really don't know what that number is. One point two, one point five. I don't know. Two point one. Uh, but clearly, clearly, if this ratio is less than one then you need to look into some other things before you declare uh, insolvency. And if it's greater than, you know, I don't know, 2.5 or some number, then you have to worry about uh, what's known as underinvestment. And then you can work your way through these, uh, the other kinds of ratios. You've seen these before. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell you to get out your phone and take a picture of this one and take a picture of that one. And you guys can put these on, on one picture. Um, I would guess that the questions on the exam would probably come in the form of not computing the ratio because look, you know, that LOS doesn't say compute the ratio and then compare. So the LOS is just compare. So they'll give you two ratios, one company and one company, and you'll say, you know, which one is the better ratio here? Uh, and you should be able to work through all that. Uh, moving on to what I always tell my students to think of as the turnover ratios, because many of these have, notice all these, all these except for a couple, many of these have the word turnover in them. And so what are we trying to do? We're trying to take something and turn it over into something else. Uh, Go ahead and skip down to the third one, total asset turnover. This is the one I talk about in class all the time, so I'll go ahead and do it here. So what do we want to do? We want to invest in total assets and we want to turn them over into lots and lots and lots of revenues, right? We want to spend $10 on assets. Then that means a $10 investment in a product line. And we want that product line to generate hundreds or thousands of dollars in total revenue. And then each... Uh, each ratio, inventory, receivables, working capital, turnover, you know, they tell us something about the effectiveness and the efficiency 
of the executive leadership team in to be able to manage its inventory, its receivables, and its total uh, net working capital. And so these ratios are pretty much a summation of what we've talked about through this entire slide deck. So go ahead, take a picture of this and take a picture of that. Go ahead and uh, as you're taking the picture, go ahead and continue to listen. But uh, fixed asset turnover and again, total asset turnover, what, what we're doing here is we're now including a measure of long-term assets in our working capital discussion. And so I think these are really, really cool and really helpful ratios to provide us with a foundation to understand what I was saying to you at the very beginning of the slide deck, that the, the reading does a great job of, and by the way, we don't know who wrote this uh, reading, uh, does a great job of focusing our attention on the short term, but it doesn't ignore the long-term impacts. And you can clearly see that in some of these ratios like net fixed asset turnover, total asset turnover. And then don't forget how to interpret <clears throat> these days, excuse me. <clears throat> don't forget to interpret these days of inventory on hand and the days of sales outstanding. I mean, what do we wanna do? We wanna have inventory uh, on our shelves for one day and we wanna have, uh, uh, the average time it takes to collect accounts receivable, we want that to be one day as well. All right, I love this LOS and I, I emphasize this to my students all, all the time. Look, what we've done is we've, we haven't computed, but we've looked at some ratios. What we need to do is two things. <clears throat> we need to look at the patterns. And I have, a, I have an assignment for my students where I ask them to compute a handful of ratios and I ask them to go back five years to look at the trend analysis, all right? So we wanna say, let's just look at our current ratio. So if our current ratio is, let's say 1.3, then 1.2, then 1.1, then 1.0, then 0 0.9 over the last five years. So what do we say? Well, we're saying that we're this is a firm who is approaching, maybe they've even exceeded that threat of, uh, and that position of insolvency. So the Institute is very likely to give you five years worth of a ratio in which there is a pretty discernible trend upward or downward. And, and you're gonna to have to make the concluding comment that says, okay, this liquidity position in my example is deteriorating. Of course, another example, it could be, uh, it could be uh, improving, right? So think about that as you're preparing for the exam. So trend analysis, but then we need to do benchmarking. So trend analysis and benchmarking. And so I can envision a table that the Institute provides you guys on the exam that says something like, all right, here's, here's Jim's donut factory. And here's a column of, you know, two or three ratios. And then here are Jim's uh, three biggest competitors over here. And here are their ratios. And the question might be something like, oh, uh, uh, tell me about uh, how Jim compares on average. You might have to take an average of those two or three how does Jim compare on average with the day's sales outstanding or something like that? So you get this here, compare a company's liquidity position to that of the peers. All right, how about evaluating short-term funding? All right, so what do we wanna do? We, as a firm, even, uh, even a company like Procter & Gamble, who is the probably great example of, what does that sentence tell us? Establish a strong short-term financing strategy. And what did I tell you earlier? Procter & Gamble uses uh, the commercial paper market, but I can assure you that Procter & Gamble uses all those sources that we talked about. Remember both the internal and the external. All right, handle peak cash needs. There's an example inside of the reading of a company that uh, makes uh, paddle boards. And for some reason, they only sell them during the summer months. So they have lots and lots of cash in the summer. And then in the wintertime, when Santa Claus is coming, they don't have any cash. So this is just a classic example of having the need for a strong short-term financing strategy. So handle peak cash needs, uh, credit sources to fund cash needs. Notice the words in there, sufficient and diversified. You don't want to just, uh, you don't want to just 
uh, throw all of your chickens into one basket. And notice the term sufficient there it means that, you know, it's one thing to have a revolving line of credit. And Jim's bank over there says, oh, yeah, you can have a revolving line of credit. I'll let you have $100 a week. You know, sufficient means, all right, let's look at our uh, cash inflows and our cash outflows. What do we need on a weekly basis? You know, maybe that number is, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars or a couple million dollars. <clears throat> Now, this third arrow point is, once again, a link to the long term. <clears throat> you know, in the short term, rates are generally relatively low. In the long term, they're probably higher. So what we need to do is make sure that we compare the yield to maturity on those longer term sources versus the shorter term sources. Uh, and, of course, consider implicit and explicit funding costs. All right, how about factors influencing a company's short term? So size and credit worthiness, that, may, that makes perfect sense, right? Legal and regulatory considerations, the nature of our assets. Do we have, do we have lots and lots of physical assets? Do we have intangible assets? Do we have a patent? You know, do we have a copyright? What do we have over there on the left-hand side? And then this is probably uh, the most important one. In my estimation of these facts, factors here, flexibility of borrowing options. You know, it's one thing to rely on operating cash flow, but let's suppose that the federal government wakes up one day and says, you know what, we think chocolate is bad for you. We're going to outlaw the manufacture of chocolate bars. All right, so what does that do if we're Milton Hershey? Well, we need to say something like, all right, we're not going to be able to rely on cash flows from the sale of our chocolate product lines, but we still have licorice, we still have icebreakers, we still have cereals, and so we're going to have to ramp up our investment in those product lines plus other product lines. What are our borrowing options? So I promise you that Milton Hershey has a plan uh, for, and of course, what a crazy, silly example that I just gave you, but Milton Hershey and all good companies that they have plans for these borrowing options. So look at those first four LOSs kind of as laying the foundation for what I believe <clears throat> to be the most important one that evaluates short-term funding choices. So to be able to evaluate the short-term funding choices, you need to be able to handle all of those uh, previous LOSs. So I want you to go look at those 10 questions at the end of the reading uh, to give you a sense of not just what you might be facing at level one, but that level two and level three kinds of questions, you know, when you have a, a, a bigger question stem, there's the potential to have more layers inside of those three potential answer choices. And so, you know, as well as I do, that the Institute does a great job of making choice A and choice B and choice C sound like they're all really, really good choices. But there's one element in each of those choices that eliminates it. And so, uh, and so you're left with the only obvious choice. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.